Most of our lives are lived between blessings. We're drawn to memories of major blessings in our lives, high points that bring smiles to our faces when we recall those memories. Truth be told, however, most of our years are lived between blessings. I believe there are some texts that can render some help for these seasons in our lives. A few of these include Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. Listen to this reading. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we possess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Some versions read boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to de deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Well, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Now, the recipients of this epistle were first century believers, scholars believe, Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem who were experiencing numerous difficulties that made it tempting to give up and just go back and live under the law and be a part of Judaism again. These brethren were in a season between blessings. The explosion of Christianity brought a rush of joy, but now there was severe persecution. They were between one blessing and waiting for another. Now, the key word in this long passage is chapter 3, verse 13, and the word encourage, or parakaleo. It's a complex Greek word that comes close to our English word counseling. The only way to complete the journey through the wilderness requires this encouragement or counseling. I'm not talking about professional counseling. I'm not opposed to it. But this context is about how we're exposed in our relationships with one another to sound advice. And as we examine this text, let's ask a few questions. Why do we need counseling? Chapter 3, 12 and 13 again. But counsel one another daily, so that none of you may be hardened. A lack of this counseling can lead to a condition of hardening. We can grow cold and, and hard. Chapter 3, verses 7 to 9 continues by saying, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the desert, 
where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years after they saw what I did. God's people were between Egypt and the Promised Land. They were in a wilderness wandering. It was a desert area, literally a place that cannot be settled. They had been slaves in Egypt, but you know the food was pretty good. They had miraculously been delivered, and yet Yahweh didn't seem to be around much in this awful wilderness wandering. Therefore, they needed encouragement. They needed counseling in this awful place between blessings. Exodus 17, verses 1 to 3 reads, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as Yahweh commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. They grumbled against Moses. The Hebrew writer is dealing with the same kind of situation. People were grumbling. People were wondering where God was. Christians were up to their necks in persecution. And the Hebrew writer is saying, don't be like our ancestors who just gave up. Keep pressing forward. Here's the principle. Life in this world is a wilderness. It's hard because it was not designed to be our permanent address. Our ancestors face tests, and, and frankly, we do too, every day. I guess you could say we're caught in the middle. In Egypt, it seemed like God showed up when Moses showed up. There were the plagues, and then, wow, the freedom. In Canaan land, Yahweh showed up with victory after victory over the pagans in the land. But here they are in the wilderness, between Egypt and Canaan, God seems so distant, so uninvolved. It's hard. It's dry. And you know there'll be seasons we'll find ourselves right here, between blessings, wondering if God is going to show up. We need counseling because it helps us to avoid becoming bitter. Without counseling, the grind can become too difficult. The Hebrews and the wilderness became hard, which led to rebellion, which led to an entire generation cut out of the promised land. Dealing with bitter believers is a drag on the whole church community. Bitter Christians stop hoping about what's to come. They infect others. Someone once said, I never met a bitter person who was thankful, nor a thankful person who is bitter. So what kind of counseling do we need? Well, true friends understand this. Proverbs 27 and verse 9 says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as, a sweet, as sweet as perfume and incense. A true friend understands the two approaches of the best counsel, truth and tenderness. And John 11 illustrates this. Jesus comes to the tomb, the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, see Jesus and they say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I want you to notice in this text that Jesus gave two responses that describe the two kinds of counseling. To Martha, he said, she says, if you had been here, my brother would have lived, verse 21. And his response in verse 23 was, your brother will rise again. He gave her a truth. That's what she needed. She needed to be reassured that he was going to rise again. But Mary, it was different. Lord, she said in verse 32, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Notice Jesus' response in verse 35. Jesus wept. He gave her tenderness. No words, no sermon, only tears. Martha needed 
truth, Mary needed tears. Sometimes we need nothing but for someone to sit down and, and to weep with us. Not a word. I remember going to the home of a widow, and an elder rode along with me. And all the way there, he was really concerned about what we should say to the family, and especially to the widow. Years of ministry has taught me the truth of Ecclesiastes 3. There is a time to weep. I told the elder we didn't need words. And when we got there, we were silent in that living room. And there were tears. The widow didn't need a few passages thrown in her direction. She needed somebody to weep with her. That's counseling 100%. Sometimes truth, sometimes tears. And we need wisdom and experience to know which to employ. And there are times that we need, you know, a spiritual punch in the gut, stern words of truth. Truth without tears is too brutal, and tears without truth is too sentimental. And a truth teller who never sets and weeps with us has no credibility. We won't listen. Counseling. True counseling is so cleansing. We need firm but loving counsel. We need the truth but mixed with tears. Going through a deeply troubling time in my life, I visited an elder friend of mine, John Ireland, at his home on Lake Isabella. We had lunch together. Thank you, Verdina. And then John said, let's go for a walk. We walked, I believe it was around the lake. John was a very sensitive elder, and I remember in the midst of his words, he just started crying. He already had credibility with me in a major way, but his tears sent the message that he loved me and that he cared that I was walking in a dark valley. This was a great memory of truth and tears. I'm truly thankful for that memory. The Hebrew writer was firm yet tender with his audience. He's saying, please don't turn back. Remember all the bodies laid out all over the wilderness. Listen to me. Help is not far away. Let's keep going. But who can provide it? Not you or me by ourselves. I know by nature some of us are fixers. We jump on a problem, we analyze it, and the words just, just flow outwards. Reminds me of the friends of Job. They thought they were fixers. When we start tinkering with emotions and the pain of others, we can leave suffering people cold and hard. Worse yet, we can leave them truly empty. We must look to our ultimate counselor, Jesus. I'm not opposed in any way to good professional counseling. Some are gifted and trained to help, and yet don't engage in this unless Jesus is invited to the party. Again, the words of Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. Jesus gets it. He's qualified because he took on human flesh and was tempted like us. When I had my first kidney stone episode, I honestly thought I was okay checking out. I called my best friend, and he was very helpful. Why? He had passed several stones and had it so bad that these stones had to be removed surgically. He absolutely understood my pain. Christianity is the only religion in the world where God placed himself literally in our flesh. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
Jesus had been rejected, he grieved. He was homesick. He experienced loss and torture. He knows. Jesus lived in unbelievable beauty and splendor, and yet came to live a homeless life so he could be our high priest. And all this with no sin, no guile. No wonder Isaiah 9 calls him Wonderful Counselor. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus um, heals a deaf mute and ah, he gives a big sigh. And then the daughter of Jairus dies and she's just a child and he's invited to go into the house and he kneels by her dead body and he says, and this is my translation of what he says, he says, honey, it's time to get up. And you know what? She did. He was so tender. When we're broken, Jesus understands exactly how to raise us up. And then in John 8, a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Have you ever ask yourself, how did these men know what was going on in private? She's just a pawn to get to Jesus. They're going to stone her. Jesus dealt with her accusers, and then he turns and looks at her and says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is a perfect balance of truth and tenderness. We might say something like, You worthless piece of trash. I got you off this time, but this is it. This is the last time. No more. And he didn't say, if you go out there and sin no more, maybe, maybe, then I won't condemn you. No, he didn't say that. Here's the principle. This is a big time one, so take notes. Jesus did not base his love for her on her behavior. I'm going to say it again. Jesus did not base his love for her on her behavior. Jesus wants us to base our behavior on his love. Sister, you're not dying today because I will die in your place. No wonder Hebrews 4.16 says, let us then approach the throne of grace with boldness or confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. That, my friends, is hopeful. It's tender. And in Hebrews 5 and verse 6, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Meaning, you never read of a priest who is a king or a king that is a priest except for this Melchizedek. The king represents God to the people. He enforces the king's laws. The priest, on the other hand, represents the people to God. Completely different roles. The priest was the caregiver. There's only one place in Scripture where one man is both a priest king and Genesis chapter 14. He was a priest of a city who offered sacrifices to God and was also a king. He shows up for a few verses and then whew, he vanishes. The author of Hebrews says, this was a foretaste of Jesus, our priest, our king. We need both in order to be saved. Jesus fills those roles. He brought both together at the cross. Notice again 5 and verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. When did Jesus cry out to be saved? Well, let's try the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's, oh yes, let's try when he was on the cross. Jesus drank the cup of woe. He took the penalty that we deserve. Infinite love was honoring infinite justice or truth. Wonderful, counselor, yes. But what about that phrase, and he was heard. 
Now, scholars have struggled with this because Jesus was not spared the bitter cup. He died. The truth is, he was heard. And he was delivered via death and resurrection. Sometimes God gives us what we want, but not in the way that we expect. So how do we experience this? May I suggest that there are two ways we can experience this. One, through the surgery of salvation. To be saved means that you're allowing this Jesus through his tears to tell you the truth about your life. Counseling heals, but it is also like a surgery. It can cut deeply. We need to admit that we need this counseling, that we are horrible sinners, and stop believing lies about ourselves that are distorting the truth. People touched by Jesus, healing and salvation, let him in. We can trust him because he was broken and shattered for us. So first, through the surgery of salvation. But secondly, through the sounds of sanctification. Note verse 13 of our text. But encourage or counsel one another daily as long as it's called today. Encourage. Parakaleo means to literally come alongside and yell. We need people to yell at us, to exhort us, to come alongside and speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. So here's the deal. Maybe right now you're in the wilderness. The God that you're praying to spent time in the wilderness doing battle with the devil. Jesus was abandoned. And he didn't get what he asked for in the garden either. He went through it all for you and for me. For him it was personal. And in the end, his suffering was redemptive. God is hearing you right now, even though you might not think so. And God will use your wilderness in a redemptive way. He endured his wilderness. With counseling, you can endure yours. What we need between blessings is a wonderful counselor. Father, thank you for giving us what we need to get through the wilderness. You gave us your son, our counselor so that we can grow into his image and to counsel others. We want to know him as our counselor as we journey. And may we apply this to our lives by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name, amen.